Hello, welcome to Will Wright's Books, Book One, Writing Session One, February 1st, uh, 2024. This is my first session, my first real writing session for my first book. I'm trying to write 11 books in 2024, one for you know, one per month for the remaining uh, months of the year. And my goal is to finish the books and submit um, each book at, by the end of the month, or at the end of the month, I'll say at the end of the month, to a publisher um, and you know, see what happens. And uh, so we got, see if I can do a, a void offense post error. So it's, this is a leap year. So I think that's right. I think we have 28 days left, a normal February worth left. I, I mean, I guess, I guess technically we have 29 days, but today is already partly over. So we'll call it 28 days remaining for the countdown because the last day I want to submit. Okay. And um, the reason I'm doing this is similar to the reason I'm trying to write one kilo tube of YouTube videos, which is to learn how to finish things uh, and to force myself to do things. Like when I say force, I mean, I don't, I don't mean force and like, okay, you absolutely have to sit there and do something. I don't mean force that way. I mean, to change the way I think about things, to remove the anxiety and remove the perfectionism that keeps me from doing and finishing things that I want to do and, and from starting and spending time on things that I want to do. Um, so I want to change the way I think in, in a deeply. I remember watching an interview with Penn Gillette from Penn and Teller who lost a tremendous amount of weight. And, uh, you know, so he, he said that he can eat anything he wants now. And people say, is that really true? You can eat anything you want? Won't you, won't you gain your weight back? He said, I can eat anything I want. What's changed is what I want to eat. What I want to eat is different than it was before. So I can eat anything I want to eat, but I've changed what I want, what I want to eat. I, I read a two-volume autobiography by Isaac Asimov a couple years ago, and I've always wanted to do writing. You know, I've always been obsessed with writing and books and fountain pens and typewriters and keyboards and everything like that, printing presses, the history of writing, the history of books and scrolls and ancient languages and modern languages. It all fascinates me completely. And in in my mind you know, I could be this writer, this, uh, there's this idea of myself that if I quit everything or if I, you know, went j from job to job and became a truck driver and then, you know, worked on an oil rig and then laid bl bricks for two years and had 50 odd jobs that in the process I would become some, some writer that that would, so, sort of like put the writer in me. Um, and, uh, but there is another point of view, which is, uh, there's this book, Professors as Writers, by Boyce. And there's another book, How to Write a Lot. Okay, and I think that's by Silva, maybe? Anyway, I hope I got that name right. These two books, I think, were really interesting for me to read. Uh, for professors as writers, Boyce makes the, the point that if you are an academic, which I am, and I think this is true of anyone who part of their job is communicating ideas, okay? So this probably applies just as well to a lot of developers and a lot of other people. Then you are a professional writer. If you are a researcher, you are a professional writer, okay? So part of my responsibility is written communication. Part of my responsibility or the expectations is that I will do things like write uh, papers. 
or write documentation or write grant proposals or write reports to funding agencies, all those things. I am a professional writer. It is not something to aspire to. I am a professional writer, whether or not I want to be a professional writer. Now, the type of writer, the type of writing I'm doing may not be, you know, what William Faulkner was doing, that kind of thing, but I am a professional writer. So uh, I should approach writing in the way of a professional. I should have a professional's mindset. And the uh, How to Write a Lot book, which is also geared towards academics, but I think, you know, I think a lot of this advice doesn't, it's, it's not specific uh, really to academics. You know, in that book, it's like, well, if you are a, a, an academic and you're teaching a class, let's say, then you have a certain period of time, maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays from, you know, 1 p.m. to 2.15 p.m., you are teaching a class, you are in the classroom, and if someone said, I'd like to have a meeting with you, or can we have coffee, or a friend's visiting, you know, that time period is not going to be time period where you can hang out, or have a meeting, or whatever. You're going to say, well, I can meet you before that time, or after that time, but you have to protect that time, because, you know, you have, you know, what are you going to do? You get someone else to cover class? So, you could cancel class, you could get someone else to cover but that's such a pain and it, you know, it sort of disrupts you know, the course. And also you're, you're kind of giving up on your responsibilities that you're not going to do that unless there's something really critical. And his point is you should treat writing in the same way. So you should, first of all, make sure you are writing on a very regular schedule, not binge writing, which I tend to do. And then secondly, for the time that you're writing, you should treat that the same as if you were teaching a class. You should not cancel that writing appointment with yourself uh, unless for the same type of event, you would also teach a class, or you're, you, you would cancel a class you're teaching, okay? Uh, I thought that was an interesting way to look at it. So both Boyce and Silva point out that you know, academics are professional writers. And I, I think this is true for many people who are communicating ideas. So I am a professional writer, and, and I do have two editions of a book published by MIT Press um, called The Reason Schemer. Th those books were written with other people, and in particular, Dan Friedman, who has a lot of experience publishing books. And Dan is a closer. He is a finisher. If Dan's going to start something, he's going to finish it. So... My issue isn't that I don't know how to write. Actually, I am a good writer. Uh, people have con you know, complimented my writing a lot when I put in the effort. My problem is, first of all, I find it really painful. And I think part of my pain, pain is the perfectionism. And it just, it just takes a lot of my effort. It like, takes my full attention when I'm doing it. And it's unpleasant. So I don't want to do it. Um, and then, uh, you know, tied to the perfectionism is it's really hard for me to finish anything. So uh, anyway, that those are interesting things, uh, that the sort of context. So this is why I'm trying to do one book uh, per month, because I've tried starting writing books many times. And every time that I've done it myself, I stopped. I just got part of the way in. You know, I think there are a lot of people who've done this. In fact, I was just reading a couple of books about about this phenomenon, um, and you know, the the Heinlein rules for writing also address this. So um, that's what I'm trying to get past. Okay, so I, I I am a professional writer, like it or not. I'm a professional speaker as well. Uh, that one I feel much more comfortable with. I I've always felt comfortable with speaking. I mean, not not really. I mean, that's kind of a lie, right? It's just I've done it a lot because I had to because I was a teacher. So I went. I didn't feel comfortable at all. <laughs> just now, I feel much more comfortable. So that was a lie. I just have to remind myself. It took a long time for me to feel comfortable speaking, and even now I get anxiety. It's just that I know how. You know, I just get over it. And because it has a beginning and an end, I can do it, and then I move on. So that's the other part of putting these deadlines, where I'm going to write a book one month. Submit it the last day of the month, and that's it. I move on to the next book. All right.
there we go. We're going to move on just like I would move on from a talk. If my talk's terrible, well, next one be better. If my book's terrible, next one will be better. And and uh, and how to write a lot, it particularly talks about this, which is if you ask a binge writer, well, when's the last time you wrote? And they're going to have to think about it, unless they're in the middle of binging. And if you ask them, when's the next time you're going to write? Is like, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, maybe I'll get inspired or whatever. You know, they're looking for inspiration. I would look for inspiration. And I would do things like buy fount fancy fountain pens. Now, I like fancy fountain pens, so, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But I get fancy fountain pens and fancy paper in, in a way to try to trick myself. And just like, well, if I had the right pen and the right paper, and then I'll get the inspiration. But... As, as Silva points out, and many other people point out, you know, professional writers don't need inspiration. They they can do it on demand. And I was reading about Harlan Ellison, who would would sit in a bookstore. He would go to bookstores, sit there with a the typewriter, and just write stories. And then, you know, as the as the pages came out of the typewriter, he put it in the the windows of of the bookstore. And people thought, oh yeah, you must be pre-gaming, you must be coming up with story ideas and plots beforehand. He said, no, uh, go ahead, give me a plot and I'll write a story for you right now. Or give, sorry, give me a story idea, give me a hook and I'll write a story for you right this second. So he could do that on demand. And his point was, you know, it's not, is like being a writer is like being a plumber or something like that, okay? It's not it's not this magical thing. It's, it's something you can do and you can train yourself um, to be, able to do it in demand. So that's what I want to do. I can I can give talks on demand now. So give me five minutes to prep. I can give a talk on any topic. Give me give me uh, 10 minutes. I can give a decent talk. Give me 30 minutes. I can give a good talk. Give me an hour to prep. I can give a really good talk. Yeah, maybe it won't be that great. Maybe it'll be good. But the point is I don't need a lot of prep time because I've just done it so many times that I, I, I don't... Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not worried about the perfectionism. Okay, I've gotten over that, and I know sort of the mechanics. That's the other part of it is like, you know, with these YouTube videos, what used to be that I would make one video, maybe two videos a year, and every time I would do it, I had so much trouble, and it's like, well, how do I edit this, and how do I set up, how do I record, and, you know, how do I do the audio, and all those things, and so it would take me week. It took me a week to record a five-minute video. Okay, now a five-minute video is hard, or a one-minute video is hard because it's so compressed. You can't mess around. Uh, so, so it's not easy in that sense. But I would just fumble around with all the technical stuff. Whereas now it's like, okay, I have a process. I've figured out the microphone situation, and I know how to level audio for YouTube now. It may not be perfect, but I can do all this stuff now quickly. And so I've, you know, after 17 videos or whatever, I already have a workflow that I can do almost in my sleep. So it's just not, not that big a deal. And I know I've made enough mistakes. That's the other thing. I've made a whole bunch of mistakes already just making these videos, like using the wrong microphone, like not, not checking that I'm using my nice microphone and accidentally using the built-in microphone of my laptop that picks up you know, the echoes in the room and the fan noise and all that stuff. So so now there's certain things I, I know to check for. And, you know, I just, I'm not making the same numbers of mistakes. I'm, I'm sure I'll make mistakes, but the other thing is if I made a mistake, well, that's fine. No problem. My next, you know. So anyway, the 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 question of an amateur, amateur or binge writer of when will you write next is, I don't know when I'm inspired, but for a professional or someone with a professional mindset, when will you write next? It'd be like asking some uh, someone teaching a course, when is your when's the next time you're going to teach? Well, it's like, well, let's see, it's Wednesday, so it's going to be uh, Thursday at one p.m. That's the next time I'm going to teach. When's the last time you taught? Well, I finished my class uh, yesterday at two fifteen. That was the last time I taught. Right. So the same with a writer. So. And it's the same with the YouTube video. So someone asks, when's the last time you wrote, you made a, a, a YouTube video? Well, last night. Okay. Um, and when's the next time you're going to make a YouTube video? Probably in, you know, within the next hour or two, right? Because um, I'm making, trying to make three a day on average. So it's just, you know, 
I, I don't even think about that anymore. I've already just after 17, 18 videos, I'm in that mindset of, well, I know I'm going to make at least one video a day unless something extraordinary happens. And I'm probably going to make two to four videos a day. So it's just, it's just something I do now. It's already, already something's changed in my brain. Okay. All right. Notice I haven't written anything yet. <laughs> you know, I'm definitely in an avoidance, avoidance mode to some extent. I mean, I'm definitely going to start writing, but, you know, I started getting nervous. I thought, oh, you should have lunch and, you know, maybe I should take a shower and I've got all these things I should do. It's like, no, this is the time to make the video because I am feeling I want to avoid doing this. I want to avoid writing. So I'm going to go through this, but then I'm going to start writing. I'll probably put the writing part in a separate video, but I do have some some things thinking about writing. So I've been reading about writing. I just wrote, I mean, I just read a book on uh, Robert, the five uh, rules of Robert Heinlein uh, last night. And, uh, you know, write, 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 write. That's the main, main thing. I, I made a Will Radio last night talking about the Vision Pro, the Apple Vision Pro, and my my interest in that, uh, I get the feeling that that that's going to turn into something really big. Maybe not the first generation, maybe the fourth generation of it. Um, and I'm, oh man, my my wallet is burning a hole in my pocket. However, um, well, for one thing, you know, it turns out you need a up to date prescription. For if you if you wear glasses and my prescription's a little out of date, so I ha would have to go and get uh, you know another eye appointment for uh, lenses. I mean, I, I get eye appointments all the time, um, but I'd have to get a new refractive appointment. So that's enough of um, you know sand in the works that I didn't immediately buy it last night. And then the other thing, well, first of all, it's expensive. It turns out it's more expensive than I thought. If you know if you kind of get it upgraded. Not surprising. So it's like a trip to Japan expensive. Um, and so I'd want to save up a little little bit. But then the other thing is, even though that'd be really interesting, I think there could be an adventure and I could even make videos showing, you know, I don't know, playing around with this thing and writing apps for it and trying to figure out visualization and whatever. Uh, while that would be an adventure, I'm already on an adventure which is, first of all, making the videos. Now, I feel like I kind of have that under control. I mean, it sounds maybe presumptuous given that I want to make a kilo tube, but uh, I, I don't know. That, I, I think I'm over the hump. It's not, not so hard for me to get started anymore. And once I get started, it's fine. So, uh, but the, the main thing is I want to write and finish books. And although the videos I'm now confident I can do, the books I am not at all confident I can do. Um, that that's still, you know, I, I I'm not confident. So I don't want to embark on this new adventure with playing around with the Vision Pro when I'm already starting another new adventure. So I decided that I will get a Vision Pro, assuming that you know it's possible to get corrective lenses for the Vision Pro for my particular prescription, which I think is possible. Um, so I will get a Vision Pro, but I get a Vision Pro after submitting six, whoops, uh, submitting six complete books. Okay. Now notice I didn't say after six months. I said after submitting six complete books. And what happens if I don't complete six books? Well, then I'm not getting a Vision Pro, am I? Um, so, you know, and if it takes me eight months to complete and submit six books, then I get a Vision Pro in eight months. Uh, that's just the deal, yo. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. And notice I picked the number six. Well, six six months, which is my predicted time. That's fine. But, but the other reason is six is more than half of 11. So I'm going to make 11, uh, write 11 books. And I want to be more than halfway, uh, through that process before I would, you know, consider getting something else. Um, hopefully after doing six books, I will have 
gotten past any, you know, the, the basic anxiety and I will have enough of, uh, of a feel for things like, well, what does it mean to submit a book? Um, do I have to self publish or indie publish? What does that mean? You know, all those things, there's all the mechanics, like I was just talking about, like, can I write a book in text format? Do I need to use Markdown? Do I need to use LaTeX? Do I need to use Word? I don't know. Um, I mean, I've got some ideas, but I just don't, I just don't have enough, enough experience. But if I, if I finish six books, okay, that's enough. That's enough experience for me to start looking at something else. So there we go. That's my reward for submitting six books, if you want to think of it that way. All right, so I've decided on two books. Book one, like I've already said, is going to be Strategies for Idiosyncratic and Creative Thinking. And I was actually, I was thinking that in some sense, this is an, um, an easy book to write because I have some thoughts. I've already given a, a Will Radio on it. And, you know, it's not going to require doing research in terms of designing a programming language. I'm not going to have to typeset a bunch of scheme code, any of those sorts of things. I'm not, not going to have to write test harnesses to make sure the code in the book is right. So from that standpoint, you know, not a big deal. It's not going to be hard to typeset. Um, but in another sense, I think this is an extremely hard book for me to write, which is good. And the reason it's hard is, you know, I guess twofold. One is like the blowhard alert. You know, who here's this guy just going on and on about, you know, whatever pet theory he has and will you shut up already? Um, I, I often don't feel that way when reading someone else's blowhard book, okay? I, I have a pretty high blowhard tolerance, uh, but not for myself. Uh, however, if someone comes to me and asks for advice or like a mentoring situation or a student or a friend, something like that, I'm, I'm happy to share what I think. I mean, I'll often give a little disclaimer, but I can give a disclaimer in the book, Um you know, so I don't I don't feel like a blowhard there, although I've been accused sometimes by my friends of being a blowhard or my family. Uh, but somehow it feels different. But the the blowhard alert, wow, that one's a really hard one for me to deal with. Um, I'll start writing something. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't listen to this. This is like, you know, turn it down. So I think this book actually is a, close to uh, about as hard as it's going to get as far as the blowhard alert goes. Um, and then the other thing is, well, what if my advice is terrible? And, you know, I just got two more books on creativity, one of which I've look, looked at before, and I think they both are terrible. I mean, for me, they're terrible. I, I, one book I tried reading, and it's like, I don't know why people like this so much. I just had to put it down. The other one, it was very focus on a particular domain. Like I've, I've read all these books on creativity for advertising executives and, you know, marketing and here's how to get as many ads in front of people or whatever. I just like, can't stand it. I just hate that. Um, I just hate ads. So that's part of it is, you know, I've read all these books I can't stand on creative thinking. There are very few books I actually like about creative thinking. So I was like, well, I'm going to probably make a, a horrible book on creative thinking as well. But I guess in, in some sense, that's okay, right? I mean, my book's probably not going to be any worse than these other horrible books. So, you know, maybe that just uh, gives me a load off. And then also, just like how you know, when a friend told me that my R6RS, uh, you know, training arc was going to be like the most boring videos on YouTube, you know, just reading the spec as, uh, you know, one one word at a time, how boring could that be? Well, okay, so let's just take the perspective that this book is going to be the worst book ever written, okay? And my advice is all going to be wrong, and it's going to be completely boring, and I'm just going to be the world's biggest blowhard. That's fine. That's accepted. And if someone criticizes my book for being horrible, it's like, absolutely, it is terrible. The only thing good I'll be able to say about this book is that I finished it and I submitted it for publication. That's the only thing good I can say about it. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's my attitude. Book two. Um, I said during one of my videos that, you know, it just came to me to write a paper, I mean, write a book on, you know, based on my talk, the, the most beautiful paper. I was a little, 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 little words. 
the most beautiful program ever written, which is my one and only talk that su succeeded somehow in capturing people's imagination, or maybe it's because it was through papers we love, it got in front of more eyes. But anyway, you know, that talk has, I think, 315,000 views on YouTube. Um, the comments were turned off by the papers we love people once uh, all the non-Lisp fans in the world found that talk, by the way. <laughs> you could you could tell the exact second that the algorithm started promoting that talk and went from, oh, this is so cool, I love it, to, you know, who's this idiot and what are these parentheses? And, you know, there's some guy in Australia, I swear I must have driven over his dog or something, the way he uh, his comments. Anyway, um. So for that, so it's not true that I just came up with that like out of the blue. And I, and I realized that right after making the video, the thing that triggered it was what I had, somehow I'd come across this, this book, uh, a reference to this book, and I bought it. And I just started looking at it. It's called uh, A Study of Bernard Riemann's 1859 Paper. That's the name of the book. It's by Terrence, M. Mur uh, Terrence P. Murphy. Okay. Um, I don't know anything about Riemann's paper other than, you know, there's like the Riemann hypothesis. Um, and this is, you know, this is about prime numbers, which I think are interesting. And this book mathematically is like way above my head. Uh, I don't know anything about analysis. I've never taken an analysis class. But I like the fact that it was going really deep into this proof. And it turns out he's got another book on complex analysis, which I just ordered that, you know, maybe if I go through that book, I'll get some sense. But uh, when I started reading this book, I could re at least read the beginning of it. You know, he's got sort of overview and I could understand that. And I thought, wow, this is so cool. There's this book on some beautiful object, some beautiful mathematical object or idea and someone who really loves it and has tried to understand the details has written a whole book on it. Uh, I would love to write a book like that someday. Like if only I knew something really beautiful, if I knew about something really beautiful that I was you know, obsessed by and had spent time thinking about, then I too could write, wait, hold on. <laughs> you know, and then I was like, wait, didn't I give this talk on the most beautiful program ever written? Um, why don't I write a book on that? So, you know, so it, it didn't come out of the blue. It's just, I sort of forgot that within uh, two minutes somehow where I got it, the idea. Uh, and I think this is actually also a really hard book. I mean, as a topic, it is an obvious topic for me to write about, of course. And I could already tell from, from the Discord server or from uh, comments on the YouTube video that people are like, you know, take my money or whatever. So people like that talk, and I know they like that talk because they send me emails or whatever. So um, it seems like the obvious topic, but I also think this is a hard hard one for me to write because I've thought about writing a book on this, and I rejected it because, like, man, you know, you can say, well, how much can I screw up a book that's on my best-known talk, right, where something's based on work I've been doing for 20 years or whatever, and my view is like, I could screw it up completely. I could completely screw it up. Completely screw it up. You know, and what if, what if the people who like my talk read my book and it's horrible? Or what if all the Java programmers who have no idea what these parentheses mean and hate it, you know, read my book, you know? So that's why I haven't written a book on this. I haven't even started a book on this topic. I've written it down multiple times as an idea for a book. But this is one, I mean, I've started lots of books and abandoned them. This one I haven't even started. It's like, just no way I could write a book on this because I just screw it up. It'll be so boring. And I gave a nice talk. If you like the talk, watch the talk. You know, I can't do it as a book. Um, so I think this is a good challenge. I think this is a good challenge. You know, other challenges. Now, I'm not going to get above, uh, ahead of myself in terms of picking topics for a book, but I'm going to think a little bit about challenges. And, and the other thing, by the way, is, you know, immediately I decided if I'm going to write a book on the most beautiful program ever written, then that should come last. That should be book number 11, right? Once I know what I'm doing, you know, that, that was like all my instincts. I should wait until I know what I'm doing. I was like, no, 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 no. There's nothing precious. 
I will write the worst book about the most beautiful program ever written. So, you know, I can write the ugliest book written, the ugliest book ever written about the most beautiful program ever written. That's fine, but it will be a done ugliest book ever written about the most beautiful program ever written. Okay, so uh, that's it. I'm gonna that will be book two, and I will finish it by the end of March, unless you know some sort of cast, cast, you know catastrophe happens that's totally out of my control. I mean, there there are things like I can't control the future. I don't know that I'll finish that in March, but. That's my intention. If something catastrophic doesn't happen, I will finish that and I will submit it by the end of March. Okay. And so what are other things? Well, doing something that's, you know, fiction, screenplay, you know, this, these are things I've always thought about. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, stories about uh, Green Top. Uh, it's a summer camp that I worked at for many years, and and that I uh, that I end up being director of, and that and that talk about precious. That's like the most precious thing, you know. I've thought about writing a book about my experiences at Green Top. That's one of the great adventures of my life, and that was way, way, way too precious. Every time I started writing it all, it's like, no, no, I can't talk about this. It's too precious. So that would be that'd be a real challenge if I wrote something about Green Top, you know. So. So basically, I want to try to find the absolute scariest topics for me to write about. I want to write those books, um, not the books that are comfortable. And, and you know, uh, the scary topics for me are not the topics that I don't know about. The scariest topics for me are the topics that I think about all the time. Um, so anyway, so those are challenges. I'm not promising any of these books. I'm just saying book one and two I've pick, picked out. Uh, okay, so that's the, uh, I, so here we go. Book two, we already have a title for that, a working title, the ugliest book ever written about the most beautiful program ever written. Okay, so that's the working title for book two. All right, um, let's get on to more. Okay, so, yeah, okay, well, got a lot more. All right. Uh, so as part of my rules, okay, so I have, um, let's open up my rules here. All right. So we've got some rules. These are general rules for writing books. So I said I'd follow Heinlein's five rules for writing. And of course that has five sub rules. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> as Focus pointed out. This is a very geek thing. You have five rules, and then each, you know, rule one has five rules. Uh, okay, so we're going to follow Heinlein's five rules for writing. You know, I, I, doo -doo -doo, let me just uh, consolidate this a little bit. Follow Robert Heinlein's five rules for writing speculative fiction. This is from a book in 1947 as the original version. He also gave a talk at West Point, or sorry, at the Naval Academy that um, had the same rules. And you can find all sorts of blog posts. And like I said, I've got a book on this. Um, it's a short book. I could read it in one sitting. That's a nice thing. And the book I read, hold on a second, I want to get the, what's the name of this? Okay, it's a book by Dean Wesley Smith called Heinlein's Rules, Five Simple Business Rules for Writing. Okay. Um, and in some sense, you know, I, I, the book is not super polished. I mean, it does feel like a one, a one draft book, which is actually one of Heinlein's rules, or yeah, um, a one write book. And uh, if you look at the table of contents, the table of contents are introduction, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and it's like surely there are titles for the chapters, right? And you go to chapter three and it says chapter three. <laughs> so, uh, okay, well, you know, but the book was done. And this this writer uh, who used to be a publisher for Harlan Ellison has, I think, published like 150 books or something, or novels or something. I mean, it's published a ton, a ton right? 
and I've published zero books on my own, uh, and but zero, zero stories. So um, maybe that was what was required to get that book done is to not come up with titles for the chapter um, chapters. And, you know, that's something to keep in mind. And the book is short. It's like 52 or 53 pages. Great. Great. That's the sort of book I can write in a month, I'm sure. All right. Anyway, uh, here we go. We'll follow uh, Robert Heinlein's five rules for writing speculative fiction. Now, according to Dean Wesley Smith, these are five business rules. But the, the way Heinlein actually wrote about it, he didn't say they're business rules. He said, you know, these are basically rules for writing speculative fiction is my understanding. But, you know. Anyway, uh, people have spent a lot of time since 1947 trying to analyze what Heinlein meant. So the first rule is you must write. Got to write, write, write. Okay, I'm going to do that. Um, if I write 11 books this year, I will have written a lot. I've written more than, you know, probably that, probably more writing in one year than uh, in my whole life up to this point. I don't know. We'll see. Two, you must finish what you start. Okay, so that's the problem I have. I, I actually don't have problems writing. I don't like it. I find it uncomfortable, but I don't have problems writing. And I used to wake up when trying to write, work on one of my books. I would wake up at, uh, you know, 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. and write every day. I was able to do that for months, and uh, then I'd throw it away. You know, and that happened multiple times. So you must finish. That's actually what I need to learn. I don't need to learn how to start, and I don't need to learn how to write. I can actually write well. Um, I need to learn how to finish. That's what I need to do. Okay, and then uh, these last ones are, are interesting. So the first two, I think that's easy to understand what those first two mean. The, the third rule, you must refrain from rewriting except to editorial order. Okay, so this is the, the rule... That gets a lot of commentary and is controversial uh, to a lot of people. So my understanding is that Heinlein's view, and you know, he's not saying anything about writing fast or writing slow, although there are the times where he talked about you need to make your word count every day. So I think he did, you know, he was writing for pulps and, and uh, you know, magazines that would pay by the uh, word. Um and he was trying to make a living doing this. So, you know, uh, he had to just output a certain number of words each week, each month, each day. Um, but besides that, that's not really what he's talking about. He's not talking about writing poorly and then, you know, not doing another draft. He's saying, you know, you write it right the first time, you know, figure out what you want to write and then write the first time. And then you're not going to rewrite it from scratch. You're not going to do some complete, total rewrite of your story and make plot changes and introduce new characters or remove new characters. You're not going to do that unless an editor for a publisher says, well, we'll publish your work if you make those changes, okay? It's not an agent. It's not a friend saying you should change it. Um, it's the publisher who's going to write you a check, says that. And then even then, Harlan Ellison amended this and then said, you know, you must refrain from rewriting except to editorial order in case you feel like it or something like that. Because Harlan Ellison was like, well, maybe I just won't rewrite it and maybe I'll submit it somewhere else. That's fine. Um, you must put it on the market. Now, obviously, the market for writing is vastly different in 1947 than it was, I mean, today than it was in 1947. So you're, you know, but um, my interpretation of this is, you know, at least depending on what I'm writing, the book, that could be an academic publisher, that could be like MIT Press, it could be, you know, I don't know, it could be an indie publisher, um, could be a magazine, you know, I don't know. But submit it somewhere. And then the last part is you must keep it on the market until sold, okay? So... If uh, you get a rejection, you submit it somewhere else. Okay. So that, and what what uh, Heinlein says is that, you know, if you follow these rules, you will be successful. But it's almost impossible for someone to follow all five rules. 
that is sort of against everyone's instincts. And, you know, most people, you know, they don't write, they get stopped there, or they don't finish, which is my problem. Um, or they sit there and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, which is also my problem if I do finish something, which is rare. Um, and, and then the people who do finish something and don't rewrite, don't, you know, put it out there. And then the people who do put it out there, as soon as they get a rejection, then, you know, that's it. And by the way, you know, this, these rules really hold also for academic writing. If you're going to write a paper for a conference, I think it's basically the same thing, right? I mean, there's no difference. You know, you're not getting paid money if you're an academic in programming languages submitting to ICFP or a workshop or Popple or whatever, but it's exactly the same rules. You know, re replace market with um, conference or venue, right? This is exactly the same rules as writing a paper. Exactly the same. There's no difference. Uh, and, you know, and people make exactly the same mistakes. And, you know, I haven't written that much academically. I've written more usually because I have co-authors. Like, I've never written a solo paper. I've written my dissertation solo. But even that, uh, a lot of the work, you know, almost all the work were things I had done with other people um, and had papers with or whatever. So uh, anyway, you know, this, these rules hold exactly for academic publishing. I don't think there's any, any difference. No difference at all. I just realized that, by the way. It was like, duh, another duh moment. All right. So let's go through the rest of my rules. 11 books submitted to publishers, whatever that means. Okay. I, I should change it to put on the market. Okay. And kept on the market. Until sold by the end. Okay. So let's match the uh, Heinlein wording. Great. Now here is a big difference. So I am not writing books because I need money in the way that um, Heinlein was doing it for a living, the support of family. Uh, I have a salary doing something else. And uh, no, I'm not opposed to making money. I've, I get checks. They're small, but I do get checks from MIT Press for the first two editions of The Reason Schemer. It was never about the money. I mean, the amount of money from The Reason Schemer books is not large, let's say. Um, but, you know, I, I do want to go through that process of going through a real publisher if possible and putting the book out there because I want people to read it and I also want to understand the process and I want to feel comfortable with it and I want to just navigate all the things, okay? Uh, navigate all the issues. Um, but at the same time, I do want people reading the books and I want people to be able to translate them in other languages and all those things. Um, and so I, I want them to be licensed under a Creative Commons license. And I was thinking... You know, do I do a Creative Commons license that's non-commercial? Do I do just a CC BY 4.0 international? Um, I'm not sure. So one of the things I do want to look at is, uh, you know, licenses from the books that MIT Press has published. Like, I think Software Design for Flexibility. I think that's covered under a Creative Commons license. I want to see what license that's, that's under. If it's just a CC BY... 4.0 international, let's say, fine, go with it. If it's a non-commercial license, then maybe I'll uh, ask Jerry Sussman or maybe I'll ask Hal Abelson for SICP or whatever. Um, so I, I do want to think about that license a little bit, but you know, I want I want it to, I want them all to be Creative Commons, and and also I don't want to chicken out on it. Okay, so I want to license things up front and put a license on GitHub and. All that, and if it's going to be CC BY, that's it. And if a publisher doesn't like CC BY, well, maybe I'll self publish. Someone can download it and do it with it as once. Well. A commercial publisher could, could you know, you do the shovelware thing and shovel a bunch of my papers or I mean books and sell it. You know, that's fine. Does Rocks Press still exist? I don't know. We'll find somewhere to put it, or or I'll just you know sell it online for people who like uh, paper. 
and you know that could be a way to support my efforts. Not that I want anyone to do that, but I don't know. I, I just want to go through the process. It's not it's not about the money. I'm sure that any amount of money I'd make is is negligible. Okay, uh, all books will be on my GitHub account. All right, so I'm gonna that's, that goes with the Creative Commons license and all that. So I'm gonna work in the open. The books are gonna be online. Uh, I'm going to record all writing um, of books, of the books, and put the videos on my channel. I guess I could live stream, right? Uh, I could live stream as well. Now, this one actually is kind of tricky. This one's tricky. In some sense, I think it's great because I need to make three videos a day anyway, right? And so... Um, making videos and it's, it's like a forcing function, right? Hey, I can make at least one video a day of me writing. So that that's uh, when that's that time of the day, whatever that time of the day is, depending on what my schedule is, then have at it. So that's great. Um, the only part that's a little tricky is that means that there are going to be times where I can't write because I can't make a video right then. So um, there are just times schedule-wise where I can't make a video. I'm not going to make a video um, at 3 a.m. You know, so I might be thinking about a book at 3 a.m. So what I'll do, I think, is you know, it's okay for me to take some notes. It's okay to to think about it, uh, turn things over in my head. But the you know, I could read a you know a paper copy and mark it up. You know, I could do all those things. Uh, but when it comes to actually uh, typing at the keyboard making changes, um, making edits, writing, writing, whatever. I want to record all of that. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. I think I think that's possible. I don't know. Um, the complete first draft of the book is in plain text. Okay, that's what I'm going to start with. Uh, you know, I could also do markdown. I could do org mode. People have given good suggestions about those. <clears throat> Um, the, the, the real purpose of, of this rule for myself <clears throat> is in the past, I've built lots and lots of infrastructure and the first edition of the reason schemer in particular, I wrote all these Perl scripts and Ken Chan was helping me write Perl scripts and we invented, you know, Dan invented this typography type thing and, you know, a sort of heroic, uh, LaTeX is how I describe it. I spent a huge amount of time. I probably spent oh at least forty hours just on the typesetting. And I'm not going to get in that what trap again if I'm going to finish anything. And the last book I tried writing, where I was waking up at four in the morning, you know, I started with the infrastructure first. And uh, well, I built a lot of infrastructure. The infrastructure is kind of cool. I don't have a book, so that's no good. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep it simple. Plain text is fine. I'm, I'm actually, and, and also, you know, if I do something fancy in LaTeX and I send it to a publisher, they might say, well, where's the Microsoft Word version? You know, send it to us in Word. Okay, well, what am I going to do then? So I'm going to just keep it simple. It's plain text is very flexible. Now, if, if a publisher says, hey, we would love this, but we want it in LaTeX, well, that's fine. Then I can go back to the Heinlein, uh, you know, Rule number three, that would be an editorial order that if I agree uh, to do that, then I'll do it. But I'm not going to do it until unless that's required. Because this is about finishing books and moving on to the next book. All right. And so rule seven, let's look at that. High level schedule. Start a book on the first of the month. That's today. I haven't started the book yet. We're still we're still talking about the rules and the, and the approach. Uh, finish writing the book on the topic chosen. No, <laughs> no changing. So yeah, I know myself well enough at this point to, to know to write down some certain rules. By the end of the month, submit the book to a publisher by the end of the month. Okay, so maybe I'll change the, the uh, publisher probably. Um, I, I won't say I, I'm going to submit it to a publisher. I will put the book on the market. Okay, so I'm going to use the Heinlein, the Heinlein terminology. Put the book on the market because market 
I, you know, like I said, I, I might end up indie publishing these. I don't know. Um, on the last day, Of that month. Okay, there we go. Um, all right. Okay, so those are my updated rules for now. Uh, all right, going back here. Oh, I right, learn you know learn about indie publishing. So. The, the book I was just reading about Heinlein's rules talks about the importance of indie publishing, which I understand can mean like a very small publishing house or uh, could also mean self-publishing. But I guess self-publishing uh, with high quality, I guess. I don't know how, how to explain that. Self-publishing has been around a long time, but usually has this idea of uh, low quality. So now they call it indie publishing when, you know, maybe even... I don't know. I don't know if people self-publish with an agent or if that even makes sense. But the point is, it's supposed to be, you know, at the level where you might have a have a press, uh, at least a small press, publish it. All right, some uh, slogans for myself: embrace uh, the boredom, embrace the suckage. Okay, that's one. Um, trying to put myself in the right mindset. My my brother showed me this TV show where it's like uh, SAS Special Forces take civilians and celebrities and run them through selection or whatever. It, the interesting thing to me is it's surprisingly similar to academia. And the people who drop out, most of them, it's not that they physically can't do it, although it sometimes happens. But it's more that they just get fed up with it. I was like, well, this sucks. I was like, Yeah. Yeah, it does suck a lot of the time. And it's like, well, I'm not going to put up with this. And I was like, yeah, I know what you mean. And uh, so I was like, why am I still in academia? Well, I guess, I guess I'm more stubborn than I am. Um, I don't know. I just maybe I have a high tolerance for suckage. But yeah, it's, it's it really sucks a lot of the time. Uh, I almost dropped out of grad school every week. I thought about quitting. Um, seriously, thought about quitting every week of grad school for six years, but I didn't. The only, the only thing I could say is I didn't quit, but I thought about it. And I, I kept thinking, it was like, wow, I was so close to quitting. And I was like, maybe I wasn't. I was just like, you know, it kind of sucked a lot of the time. And um, half of my friends did quit. Half the, half the people who started my PhD quit. Uh, now, you know, in industry, you can get a lot of money. So that was part of it. You know, sort of like it was sucking in, in uh, grad school for them. And industry uh, paid a lot. So that that was a very easy choice, and if you wanted to stay, you sort of had to, um, to some extent, want it enough that you would embrace the suckage, okay? And that was exactly what it was like on this TV show, where they said, yeah, if you if you get through selection, that means that for whatever reason, there's a reason for you to get up every day and do this, and uh, you kind of get to the point where the, you're okay with the with it sucking or even you know, some part of you has to even enjoy that. Um, you know, otherwise you're probably just not going to last that long because it is, it does suck a lot of time, you know? And then, uh, the other slogan for myself is from Ed Wood, the movie Ed Wood, where the character of Ed Wood played by Johnny Depp is calling, I guess his producer and says, Hey, have you seen my mo latest movie? And the producer says something like, that's the worst movie I've ever seen in my entire life. And Ed Wood says, oh, well, my next one will be better. Okay, so that is my philosophy. If if I write the worst book ever uh, written, then my next one will be better. But I will write the next one. Okay, Olin Shivers' meta advice, which is... Um, okay, so, so now we're starting to get into you know, things that might actually go into the book. Um, uh, all right, so I'm going to grab these. These are just things I was thinking about. So let me let me stick those. I don't know what I'm going to do about this. Okay, I'm not sure how I'm going to organize the book yet. We'll figure that out. Uh, so those are just some ideas. Okay, so here, this is useful. Um, <laughs> Okay. 
Okay. Got some meta advice to myself. So these are so important. I'm going to put them up top in the file. So I want to keep, keep reminding that. Okay. So the Creative Commons license, you know, I think I'm going to go by CC BY. I, I will check to see what MIT Press was publishing, but I, I really want the CC BY, uh, CC BY. So if either software designed for flexibility or SICP uses those licenses, I'm just going to go ahead and use those, use the CC BY. Even if, even if no publisher will publish it, that's fine. But, you know, I want to stick my, my guns. I don't want to, you know, finally talk to a publisher and the publisher is like, well, you know, um, you need to use this license or we won't publish it. And it's like, okay, that's fine. If, if, if no one will publish it because of license, then I'll self-publish. But I am going to um, look at like SDF, the software design for flexibility. See, so see how that's licensed and how SACP are licensed. So just, just kind of a reality check um, just to make sure I'm not missing something important. If, if I have a question about it, I can ask Jerry Sussman or maybe Hal Abelson. Um, Okay, here's an important thing to remind myself, especially for, for the book two, The Most Beautiful Program Ever Written. This thing I have to remind myself a lot, that the apparent amount of effort is not indicative of quality. Okay, so, okay, if I spend a month writing a book, well, how good can the book be? But it's sort of like, uh, you know, when I, when I was preparing for that talk, the most beautiful program ever written, I was in New York, I was in Manhattan, and actually I was there to give a different talk. I was there to give a talk that I gave the night before, and that didn't go very well because there, there were AV problems and, you know, whatever reason, that wasn't my best talk, and it kind of bombed, actually. Um and then I, you know, kind of shook myself off. And th this was the, this is the whole thing about the, being the professional, right? It was like, okay, that talk wasn't so great. Um, when's your next talk? Well, the next night, the next night was my next talk. Okay. So gave a talk that wasn't, wasn't the greatest. And then the next night I gave, you know, frankly bombed. And then the next night I gave my most, most successful night, right? That's, that's not that surprising. Um, give a talk that bombed next night, most successful. Fine. So, and the way I prepared for that talk was I, I just didn't have that much time and I was kind of tired and my schedule was off. I was staying at this hotel in Chinatown in Manhattan. And uh, just before going to the, to give the talk at Papers We Love, I had a little bit of time. So before I had talked to a friend and kind of screwed up my courage, like, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to kind of go for it. And, and first of all, papers you love, you normally you're talking about someone else's work, not your own, right? But I'm like, you know, I really love this program. And I love the program so much that I'm going to talk about that. I've also also done work on it. So I'm going to stick myself in this, you know, sort of gonzo journalism. Um, and that, as far as I had known, you know, no one else had done that for papers we love. I don't know if anyone else has done that. Um, but I was like, okay, well, that might be, talk about blowhard, right? Here I'm going to talk about my own my own work in a, in a talk titled the most beautiful program I've ever written. Right. Like how obnoxious is that? So I was like, wow, this might really, it is going to be recorded. You know, this is going to be horrible. It's going to be infamous. So I had to really screw up my courage for that one. And, uh, the, the, the only real preparation I did was I had maybe like 40 minutes that, um, before I could give the talk, you know, before I went, had to go and give the talk, where I was in my hotel room in the afternoon, I just closed all the curtains and I was either on the couch or curled up on bed on the bed in the hotel, just with my eyes closed. And I just, you know, visualized for 40 minutes. I just thought about what I wanted to talk about and just roughly what the order might be. And I talked about all these things before for the most part. Um, but trying to stitch them together. I'd never given a version of that length. And I knew it was going to be very complicated because it was going to live code everything. That was the other thing. I had to screw myself up, you know, to, to live code everything. And I knew that something could, you know, sometimes I've given live code talks and, and just like everything broke, like the file didn't load. Right? So I'm going to give this 90 minute talk. Everything's live coded and like five minutes in, everything breaks right? Or my laptop dies or something, right? You know, all of those things can and, and will happen. So, 
uh, you know, so I had to screw up my courage and then had to organize everything in my head. And then I spent, you know, maybe five minutes organizing the files on my laptop. So it'd be able to load things. Um, and then, you know, maybe spend a couple of minutes just like practicing running a couple of expressions, uh, practice typing, make sure I, I was uh, kind of warmed up, but that, that was it. That was the whole prep. So for by far my most popular talk, um, I, I prepped for like 40 minutes. So, I mean, let, let me do a little calculation here. So that was about a 90 minute talk and there are 315,000 views right now. Um, and so let's divide that. Okay, so that's how many minutes. So divide by 60 to see how many hours there are and divide that by 24 hours and divide that by 365 and a quarter. Okay, so um, people have watched that talk for a, almost 54 years of time. So if one person watching that talk on YouTube 54 hours straight, and I prepared for it for uh, 40 minutes. Okay, so that's like, what's the, what's the uh, compression factor, I guess? So, you know, that's how many... Um, Anyway, you can see the the, the game, right? So um, someone might say, well, you only prepared for it for 40 minutes. You know, how good could it be? Uh, but I'd prepared for it for like 15 years, like really intensely. Um, and, and I'd prepared for it before that because I was a public school teacher and gave huge numbers of talks and, you know, run a summer, summer camp where I was always, you know, presenting to people and I've been programming for a long time. So yeah, it was 40 minutes, but you know, it was more like 40 minutes to organize. So I, I just have to remind myself that if I write a book in 30, 30 days or whatever, um, but I write it on something I've thought about for 20 years, well, the actual w amount of effort that went into the book is 20 years, not 30 days. So that uh, hopefully I can remind myself. And, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm not going to copy that over from my book. Okay, so I'm done my notes there. Done these No, That took a while. Wow. Well, we're an hour in. You can see how much I'm trying to avoid writing, huh? Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'm ready to start writing. And so my basic plan is going to be to start with uh, the real Will Radio notes and then some some notes based on some comments and some other thoughts I've had and then going to move them into book.txt and then start coming up with a, a, a you know bigger plan um, the other thing I thought about is maybe doing something with the transcript you know from the YouTube video get uh, extract the transcript mm. yeah I don't know but that's for another video so this, this first video was really about context and getting started and organizing my thoughts and kind of getting myself, um, I don't know, pointed in the right direction. Uh, so my next video, I'll actually do writing. Uh, but I did want to, because I was getting anxious and coming up with excuses as to why, <laughs> why, why I didn't need to make a video right away and, and start working on the book. Um, so I think I've earned... Uh, a quick lunch, but not a long lunch, and then I'm going to start start working again. So I will stop the video, and hopefully I will keep the screen exactly as it is, and then um, hop into actually working on the book. So I've spent zero minutes actually working on the book, writing, um, but that will be the beginning of the next session. Okay. All right. See you soon, I hope.